and welcome everyone. Let us pray. Our Father, in the presence of your people, we praise your name. We see your glory. We see that your word, living and active, upholds all things, that your word crushes the head of the serpent, that your word protects your people by that enmity that you place between your people and those whom you are giving over to disobedience. And with humble hearts, we praise you and glorify you May you be our teacher in this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember, this is the verse that we were working with. How does the word of God uphold all things? Does anybody need a copy of the lesson? Because I have copies of the lesson. And if you did not get one, we have one. And I have girls here that are just waiting to hand them out to you. So if somebody raises their hand, charge them a dollar. <laughs> I just believe, and I think you agree with me, this verse is foundation to understanding of history. And that's what we're going to be working with. Did you run out? I have one more that is not stapled together. Dan, are you without one? You don't have one. Benjamin, you must begin reading this verse, sir. <laughs> I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his ear. And that, thank you, and that enmity comes from who? From God. From God. And what is its purpose? To protect us. It protects you. How? It keeps you from the evil things in the world. That's right. By the Holy Spirit. You and I hate sin. We're convicted of sin, and the world hates us, and so we are kept separate. And so, as we said last week, you saw this slide before, the entire history of the world can only be truly understood by knowing God has, is, and will continue to set enmity between his covenant people and those who he has given over to disobedience. Do you agree with that? That's where we don't always look at history that way at all. But God is active in history. And he is building a church, and he's giving another group over to disobedience. And so we have this Ephesians 2, 22 passage, Marcel. And had placed all the things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the tribe. His, his body, the fullness of him who builds everything and every way. Thank you, Marasau. Do you see how this verse ties into Genesis 3.15? I am crushing the head of the serpent. Christ is ruling over everything for the church. That's the same vision that you and I must have as we look at history. And so, letter E, I think that's on yours. How does history reveal Christ is bruising the serpent's head? And Christ's rule has, continues to transform hearts and minds. What does Paul say uh, in, in Romans chapter 12? Don't conform to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who renews your mind? God does. The Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gives life. Gives physical life. Gives spiritual life. 
In him we have abundant love. And so you will see this, uh, this evening that the hearts and minds of millions of men and women have been transformed over the past 2,000 years. That's what we're going to be looking at. And these notes will not be real difficult. And so, number one, did I give you this one last time? There is that condemning and challenging infanticide, abortion, euthanasia, prostitution. That has not ended, but it began in the early church with the early Christians in the Roman Empire. And there, when you have the Holy Spirit, you know what justice is. The Holy Spirit convicts us, convicts us of sin. Well, the church's purpose is to be light and salt in the world, and here's how it's played out when it comes to these things. Number two, let's have this one read. Jetty, are you able to read this? Yep. Um, rescuing and adopting abandoned children while condemning and bringing the practice to an end. All right. Uh, this is similar to number one, but it was po possible in Rome that you could abandon children, I think up to three years of age. You got sick of this kid. You kids better listen up here, right? <laughs> but I don't think there's any danger with you. But if you became disappointed, this kid is a problem, he's not the one, she's not the one you wanted, you could abandon them out in the field. Christians went out there and to find these children, they would adopt these children and they condemned uh, and they brought that practice to an end. That's through the church. That's through the Holy Spirit. That's the work of Christ putting enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Here is a third one. Are you ready to read this, Josiah? Okay, then I'm going to go to Julie. Defending the unborn child by challenging the legalization of abortion while caring for single and or desperate mothers before and after childbirth. That is more of a modern trend that I think speaks so beautifully of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. We defend the unborn child. And we're really grateful for what has happened so far, but we know the challenges that are coming we also provide care for single, desperate mothers before and after childbirth. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That is how the church functions in the lives of the unborn. Number four, we're going to go to Donna. Condemning and outlawing gladiatorial games. What were, thank you, what are gladiatorial games? When they killed Christians inside the Colosseum. Okay, that, that happened. Yeah. Uh, Christians were brought into the Colosseums. The Colosseum is free. You could go there, sit there, and watch lions kill Christians. The gladiatorial games, where you had two men who are fighting each other to death. One of them would kill the other one, and that filled the Colosseum. That was Roman culture, violent, and that was condemned through the church. As the church continues to grow by the Holy Spirit, it outlaws gladiatorial games. What's wrong with them? Murder. Let's murder. The image of God. But you see, in a dark world, there is no respect for life. And so these things were brought to an end by the church. Number five, Chuck. Condemning suicide while providing counseling to the depressed. All right, that has been going on for many, many years, and it's still going on today. We condemn suicide, but 
we do not come to the conclusion that a person who has committed suicide is, is necessarily lost. We understand that all of our sins are forgiven, and if I say past, present, and future, would you agree with that? Yeah, and so, you know, the reasons for suicide uh, can be mental illness, we don't know what is going on, but uh, we try to provide counseling to the depressed. And so suicide is a tremendous cause of death in the world today. Sadly to say, South Korea has the highest rate of suicides of any country because of the pressure that they put on their children and young people to excel because the parents' life is so tied up into the success of their children. And when a child does not perform well at the university level, uh, that is just such a shaming thing. But it's really, really sad. And so this is another thing that we work with. Number six. Providing free public education for all children to learn to read Learn to read the Bible. <clears throat> Thank you, and my period is missing me. Uh, that's how education began in the United States. The, the pilgrims, the Puritans, they established public schools for all children. And those schools were free, but they were for learning to read the scripture, because the, the Puritans and the, the pilgrims, I love, love, them, love them all together, they had such an understanding that the word of God is the foundation for all of learning. You read Harvard's uh, uh, founding statement, and uh, I, I sort of know it in my head, but, but it, let every student understand you know, that learning is to know God and to enjoy Him forever. Let Christ be laid the foundation of all learning. And so the emphasis on learning to read the Bible, that's the living Word of God, is going to shape the minds of our children. And it's those children that, you know, set up governments. It's this philosophy that brings us really to the Declaration of Independence, that brings us to a constitution that has three levels of government, branches of government. Why are there three branches of government? Checks and balances. Checks and balances, correct. Those framers of the constitution had an understanding that man is sinful. And we need to have separate branches of government to protect the, you know, one group from ruling over everybody else. And so public education began as schools where they would be learn, they would learn math, and they would learn to write, and they would learn to read, and the Bible was the textbook. In Adam's fall, you know the rest of it? You didn't go to school then, right? In Adam's fall, we sinned all. That's one of the first things these kids would learn. It was doctrinal teaching that comes from the church, public education. Number seven. Giving dignity to all honest and moral labor. You probably understand that in the world, there is, you know, what kind of work do you do? And then whether you did manual labor, oh, you poor thing, you know, that's your lower class. I don't think you and I think that way today, do we? I don't. Whether you are working in the office, whether you are managing, whether you're the president of a company, or whether you are working on the assembly line, or whether you are digging ditches, Whatever 
from the biblical view, all work that's honest work and that's morally correct has dignity. Why is that? Why don't we laugh at certain jobs? Why do we respect janitors in the same way we respect managers? Because they're all important. They're all important. And they are all doing the work that God has prepared for them to do before the creation of the world. That's something we have to remember. That is the, that passage in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, I think it's 10. We are God's workmanship. That's number one. Created in Christ Jesus to do the work which he has ordained for us to do before the creation of the world. There is not kingdom work and then there is secular work. All work is kingdom work. And whether you are cooking or cleaning or driving a taxi or whether you are the president of a company makes no difference. There is no work that is outside of the kingdom of God. Would you agree? That's why I respect all of you very, very much. Al, there's also the, the idea around the body of Christ, right? And each, there's different parts. We're not all the same. John, thank you for saying that. Romans chapter 12. We are all members of the body of Christ. We all belong to each other. And the eye can't say, well, I'm more powerful, I'm more important than you. And... That's not, that's not true. And I will never treat anybody in a different way because of the job they have. I respect you and I honor you. Thank you, John, very much. Anybody else have a comment? Well, we keep traveling. Number eight, Michael. Providing a safe and healthy work environment with fair wages and responsible working hours. Thank you very much. If I say labor unions, that maybe has a bad taste in your mouth. Why did labor unions begin? Terrible working conditions. They were terrible. They, you worked long hours. You, look, you worked in unsafe conditions. You worked in in environments which were not healthy at all. And they had kids working. That had kids working. Uh, I have a, a book in my shelves that shows children as young as five years old working, sorting coal from rock. Why, why did they do that? Why would a parent... There's money for the family. They needed the money. These are immigrant families. And so they're paying rent, they're paying utilities, and so they don't have enough money, and so every child would go to work to help support the family. And so it was necessary that there would be these labor unions to come in and to protect the workers. Wages, the environment, the length of hours, because a family must be a family. There must be a time where dad and mom and the family are together, where there is a home where they are together building each other up and living together. Well, when you have to work 14, 16 hours a day and you got paid a little money, you had to work all the time in order to pay the bill. It's through the churches, through Christians, that that was recognized as absolutely wrong. And so here you have another example of Christ crushing the serpent's head. 
Number nine. Establish some free markets and capitalism. Thank you. Is capitalism a bad word here? This economic system is very biblical. Why? A man earns his wages. That's right. Paul holds us responsible to take care of ourselves and to take care of our families and capitalism allows you to use the talents and the gifts God has given you to build up your family, to give you a hope and a future. When uh, Joel <coughs> says, in, uh, and Peter repeats it, your old men shall dream dreams, uh, I can understand you're going to go there in a spiritual sense, but it is also, in a sense, where you have dreaming dreams, how I can live, how I can be creative, how I can improve this and improve that. That can only happen in a capitalistic society, not in a communistic society, not in an oppressive society. You need to be free and creative. Same way, your young men shall have vision. The only place they have visions is where they're not oppressed, where there is an environment of free markets and capitalism. Does that make sense to you? Number 10, Jen. Uh, providing a fertile stimulus for the development of operational science. Thank you. When I speak of operational science, that is separate from historical science. Historical science is a study of the past. Historical science, you pick up a rock and you look at it and you say, well, I believe I can tell the whole history of this rock. It's millions of years old. Look at these layers and all of this stuff. You pick up a fossil. And you look at it and you say, well, this is what this is from, and so on. Historical science is not science. Historical science is assumptions. You cannot repeat historical science. You cannot put it in a test tube and try to make it work again. You can't go back to the Big Bang and try to second Big Bang. Historical science is not science. It's assumption. Operational science is how you got those delicious sandwiches this evening, and how you got all of this wonderful dinner. It's how you drove here. Operational science takes the uh, covenants God has put into the creation, and we can invent, we can discover, invent, employ things, and our lives are greatly improved. Look what we got here with this computer and all of these things. Isn't that wonderful? We've got electricity in here. Uh, not all cultures have that. This morning I said something about, you know, why do the women in India still carry water on, you know, buckets on their head? Well, the answer to that is they live under a religion of Hinduism which believes the most holy thing you can do is sit, uh, you know, what is that called, Indian style, when your legs are like that, and, you know, almost naked, with nothing around you, babbling a word over and over and over, and, wow, you're really a holy man. That's why they're still kind of carrying water on their heads. You and I, being filled with the Holy Spirit, having an accurate understanding that man is to subdue the earth. We happen to have delicious Mayaska County water. Just turn on the tap. Relate that to the power of the Holy Spirit. 
enlivening your old men shall dream dreams, and this includes women from my perspective, and your young men shall have visions. Does that make sense to you? A culture that worships the creation and not the creator will not have a fertile stimulus for the development of operational science. Okay. Number 11. Mark. Guaranteeing liberty, justice, and equity of opportunity for all individuals. Thank you. You see that is in written in our Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, and they have these rights. And so, if you are not convicted by the Holy Spirit that the people that you are living with are image bearers of God, they stand before God in the same way you and I do, then you're not going to guarantee liberty. Oppressive cultures, oppressive political systems cannot allow liberty to be experienced because they're going to lose their authority. We believe in liberty, uh, and I, I want to say, what it was, it was Madison, I think, who said this. Or no, Adams. John Adams, he said, the Constitution which we have written will only work if all of those who come under its, you know, guidance <laughs> are obedient to a higher power. If man ever loses, his understanding that he must be <coughs> obedient to God, this Constitution will be the worst document there is. That's kind of a summary of what he wrote. We're not afraid to give liberty to anyone who's filled with the knowledge of God. We are not afraid to give liberty to anyone who is controlled by the Spirit of God. Be free. Justice. That is so important, and it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us when there is injustice, and then we need the power of the Holy Spirit to speak up against it, but there must be justice. Read the book of Amos. There was very little justice at the time of Amos. You trample on the poor. You sell them, you know, for silver. There's all of this injustice and we believe in the equality of opportunity for all individuals. You have the same opportunities. Now, we don't all do the same thing, but we believe everybody should have an education, everybody should be able to try to do what they can possibly do. When you live in another kind of government, uh, then you're controlled. When I lived in Romania for a year, they had just come out of communism, and you know, they were not used to making decisions. They were always told, well, you're going to plant that field, and you're going to plant it tomorrow, and you know, it didn't make a difference what the weather was. Uh, that came out uh, very, very clearly once. There was a hole in the sidewalk. There was a you know, the sidewalk had sunk, and they just stuck a tree branch in there so nobody would fall in the hole. And then I asked them, I said, why don't you just put some dirt in there? Well, nobody's told us. Because that's their thinking. And you and I who are brought up with liberty, with justice, with the sense of opportunity, we would fill that hole up and go on. It's the biblical view of man that liberty and justice and equality is going to thrive, going to, going to be there. When we leave the biblical foundation, then we really are going to lose this liberty and justice and equality. And I look at that today with the woke culture and the cancel culture. You disagree with them, they cancel you out. There's no liberty there. There's no justice. 
Number 12, Joy. Working for the abolition of slavery of all kinds. Thank you. Uh, the abolition of slavery began in England, Christians in the parliament, uh, and this abolition of slavery comes from a biblical understanding of man. What's wrong with slavery? They aren't getting what they deserve for their work. <laughs> That's right. We are reducing their being image bearers of God. We are saying, you are an animal. You're going to work for me. And boy, if you had a slave, they're so intelligent. They're so capable. You can train them. And so the abolition of slavery comes out of a knowledge of who man is. Now you can say, well, there was slavery in the Bible. That is true. Number 13. Uh, Stimulating great architecture. How does the church stimulate great architecture? How does God, some of the greatest architecture, isn't that amazing? Now, of course, this is relative. This is what I love. I just think these cathedrals, you walk into them, what happens to your spirit? Is it crushed? There's light. There is beauty. There is just absolute glorious place. Great architecture. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall have visions. Because here you have the freedom to build these things. Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Number 14, Deb. Inspiring the composition of beautiful music and creating musical instruments. Beethoven, Handel, Mozart, and many hymn writers. Thank you. What music comes out of Islam? Zero. There is no music. You live in Iran, Iraq. There's no music, not even set. I, I heard some music come out of the Buddhist temples, but I am understood, I'm understanding, that's what the Koreans told me, that they developed some music to compete with the Christian church. Because the Christian church, you know, initially, uh, this was Luther, but not only Luther, there were others who said the, the worship of the church, the singing must always be doctrinal. It must be God-focused. It must teach the truths of Scripture. And so many of us love a mighty fortress is our God. Read that whole thing through. You are reading fantastic doctrinal truths of the church. And that, that music was employed to teach the masses whom God was bringing into the church. How do you teach them? And so teaching them through singing is wonderful. Maybe you studied Spanish or German or some other language, and you probably learned some of it by, by singing, because it's a great way to learn vocabulary, a great way to learn word order. And so the great music of the, of the church is still some of the greatest music in Western culture. It comes out of this firm knowledge of God's salvation, and these people wrote great hymns. Now, you know, we call it classical music, and I don't know, some people don't like classical. They like bluegrass or something else. But this is powerful music that has stood the test of time. 
Joe. You may not have musical, sorry, musical instruments then either. Uh, I am not an expert on the history of musical instruments, and I'm not going to touch that. Donna, you are a great musician. Do you know the history of musical instruments? No, I'm just surprised that they don't have any music. Okay, they didn't have oatmeal boxes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the great organs, they come at the time of, of uh, these great in. And uh, I'm glad to see organs are still used in both churches here in this town. Uh, but I'm very prejudiced. I just believe it's the king of, of the instrument. And it's so supportive to the, the singing. It's just grand material. And how the musical instruments of the Bible come in in Genesis 4. Genesis 4. They were uh, making or to Altain, he was the forger of all instruments, bronze and iron. Okay. Thank you, John. I knew that, but it did not come into my mind. Thank you. Number 15. Rich. Inspiring and creating great works of art. Da Vinci and Rembrandt and Durer and so on. Some of the greatest artwork is biblical represent it's a representation of biblical events. And you know, here I am, I, I guess it's my class, and I can show you the, the great artwork that I love. And you have this great artwork. This is the return of the prodigal by Rembrandt. And the prodigal is there in his father's arms. Rembrandt used a blind neighbor to be the father. And if you look at him, you're going to see that it's a man's hand here, and it's a mother's hand here. Because Rembrandt understood this father is gone and there is authority and there's mercy and he paints that here is the older brother uh, we don't really know who these two people are but uh, Rembrandt uh, really painted a very excellent picture here's this prodigal son comes back looking like that and he's going to have the best robe in the house put on him. And who had the best robe? The father. And so he's going to be covered with the righteousness of his father. So that painting, to me, is just absolutely beautiful. Now, you can say, well, I've seen prettier pictures. <laughs> but look at the meaning. <clears throat> Look at the depth of that picture. If you want to read a really good uh, book, Henry Nowen wrote The Return of the Product. And he has, oh, it's probably about 100 pages. Henry sat in front of this painting in Russia. And he wrote his thoughts, and he has a tremendous insight. And he says, we all identify with the prodigal son. That's pretty easy. And we all identify with the older brother. But he says, the one we must become is the father. I just really find that amazing. We must be the ones. Come to me, and I will give you rest. So, great works of art. This is great stuff. <coughs> Number 16. Inspiring the great, inspiring the writing of great literature, Augustine's <coughs> City of God and Confessions, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity and Screwtape Letters. Uh, thank you, 
the city of God and confessions. Augustine lives during the third century. Uh, he was a young man who lived in a, a very disobedient life, immoral life. And if you think, well, if I read Confessions, it's probably pretty juicy. It's not. Confessions is confessing before God that God is Lord and King and God saved him. The city of God is really the foundation of Western culture. John Calvin's institutes are the foundation of our Western culture. They are fantastic stuff, how the Word of God applies to all areas of life. Uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, I highly recommend that one too. That's the first book that I read that changed my thinking. And I just find C.S. Lewis so interesting in that book, how he defends Christianity. And we've talked about screw tape letters before, right? Screw tape is a little practice devil, and he's writing letters to Satan, uh, no, no, he's, uh, no, his name is Wor Wormwood. Uh, Wormwood writes to Screwtape, who is his boss, teaching him how to tempt people. It's just a very insightful book. But that's all inspired by the Christian people who understand it. Number 17. Introducing such phrases as goodbye and AD and BC. Thank you. What is goodbye? Where does it come from? It's a short expression of God be with you. That's its root. Today we just say goodbye. You know AD and you know B.C., which they have now changed, right? Before the Common Era and after the Common Era. We have to keep going. 18, Mariah. Open Europe. Europe opened up. It was in the Dark Ages. When you have the Reformation, Europe opens up and becomes a powerhouse in, when, in, in the world of politics, in the world of science, in the world of economics. Number 19. Brought the Reformation. The Reformation. There's always been Reformation in the church. All through the Old Testament, you have Reformation. Through the Book of Acts, there's Reformation. There's Paul pushing for Reformation. You have Reformation, uh, you know, to the early church, and it keeps going. But when we talk about the Reformation, that is when the church is taken out of the darkness of Catholicism and brought into the glorious freedom of Christ. Thank you. Number 20. Brought democracy. Democracy, thank you, means people rule. And the only place people are going to be able to rule correctly is when they have the Spirit of God in them. Democracies must be founded on a higher authority, and when we have God as our authority, we can live in a democracy, and actually you can live in any form of government if God is controlling those who are ruling. But democracy, uh, what did the church all say? Democracy is the worst form of government there is in the world, except for all the others. <laughs> I found that very exciting. Number 21. Open the university. The university. What does universe mean? You all play Uno, right? Uno means? One. And verse means? Word. Word. The word universe means one word. Confessing Genesis chapter 1. The university began to study the Word. <coughs> all the great universities, Harvard and Yale, were all started by these Puritans and these pilgrims. And their original founding statements were wonderful. 
And so the university, because the creation is to be studied, is to be subdued, originates in the church. 22. Establish private property. Thank you. Where in the Bible do you get the idea that private property is God's intention? I didn't hear that one. In the Garden of Eden. And how? Thank you. Do you remember this commandment, thou shalt not steal? The only thing you can steal is what belongs to somebody else. So that's an understanding that there is to be private property. This is mine. I'm king over this, and I can dream with it, and I can plan with it. Number 23, hated. Brought res respect for the freedom of man. This whole idea that men can rule themselves, and I mean human beings, was a whole new experience. <coughs> Not having a king to rule over man, how could that ever work? It will only work, again, if we are controlled by the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God is removed from a culture, from an institution, we're going to land up with brokenness and chaos. And that's the direction we're going today because we've removed God from our places. Now, there's this thing right here. Did you read it, Collins? Genesis 8, verse 22. While the earth remains seed time, the harvest cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Thank you. Here's another verse that's going to be very effective in history. And so when we look at that, what impact does this verse have on meteorology? When I'm cold right now because it's end of winter, I know that the warm weather will be coming. I thank you very much. There's going to be that. What impact does this have on our understanding of global warming or climate change? And I dare to bring this up because the Kleins and Joyce did not bring tomatoes, okay? <laughs> Do you get me? You can't throw tomatoes at me, I hope, sorry. <laughs> Okay, this is God's covenant with meteorology. That's what Kelly is referring to. He will continue to command the seasons to come at their appointed time. That's God's covenant. How man wants to look at it, you know, if you don't believe God has a covenant with creation, you're going to need to become word. And we say, we don't worry. He will continue to provide the conditions for us to be able to grow food. Historically, climate does change over time and will continue to change. Do you believe that? I'm going to show you some pictures very soon. God closes off some areas of agriculture opens up areas which were formerly which we formerly could not use. And so look at that. This is fabric found under a retreating glacier. Here is a horseshoe found under a retreating glacier. Here is an arrowhead under a retreating great glacier. What does that tell you? They were animals, <coughs> and people were hunting animals. At one time this was farmable, and then it was covered. Now it's becoming farmable again. And so here you have all of the, the red dots are the places where we had woolly mammoths, and woolly rhinoceroses, well, you see the Arctic Ocean. This whole area today is all Arctic. It's all covered with ice. And so 
Here you have, in 19, 1901, a photo of Berezovska, that's the name of this woolly mammoth, being removed from the frozen ground in Siberia. And so here's what he looks like in the museum. This is another picture of him in the museum. The, the fur that you see on him is original, but the rest of it, he was eaten off by dogs, as, the, as you know, every spring rocks come up out of the ground. Well, so do woolly mammoth remains, and if dogs get to them earlier, they're going to eat them, but he's been reconstructed. We find little baby mammoths. The ears of woolly rhinoceros, they used to live there. They don't live there anymore. Here's the saber-toothed cat. And here is another sculpture of that saber-toothed cat. They've become extinct. But those areas once supported life. Today, they do not. And so, what impact does this have on our understanding of global warming or climate change? I'm sorry to push this through to you, but I don't know what else to do. The Earth, God says to Noah, would quickly recover from the catastrophic climate change during the flood. I want to talk about a climate change. That was a climate change. But it's going to be restored. And we believe the Ice Age happens right after the flood because of all the volcanic dust in the atmosphere. You have the book of Job written at the time of Abraham, we believe, talks a lot about ice and so on. And so there was an Ice Age. We do not deny that. But we believe the flood was the cause of that. The Bible records God orchestrated weather events as judgments or blessings. And here are examples of those events. And then Genesis 14, those seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. Climate change? You better believe it. You have Deuteronomy 28. God says, if you live in disobedience, your crop is going to fail. I will turn the, 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 you know, the soil to dust, and you're not going to survive. Or there's the withholding of rain for three years through Elijah, and the sending an abundance of rain through Elijah. We don't deny climate change. What we're saying is they come as God's judgments throughout Scripture. And so the 1970s, if you're my age, you remember the Ice Age? Remember we're going to go into the Ice Age? Mark, you remember that, don't you? Or not? 1989, predictions of rising sea levels will wipe out the en entire nations by 2000. You remember that happening, don't you? See? Here's Time Magazine, 1977. How to survive the coming Ice Age. 2008, be worried, be very worried, because now it's global warming. And sort of you young kids think, you know, wonder why you old people don't agree with this stuff. This is why we don't agree with this stuff, because we've heard this stuff before. <laughs> We're being told polar bears are threatened by extinction, but their numbers have been increasing since 2005. So, Romans 1.20, who's my next reader, Ethan? Of course, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen by understood from what He has been made so that people are without excuses. That's right. We know God. His eternal power and divine nature are upholding all of these things. And that's where we are. That last question, really quickly, uh, I've changed it from the book. How does the Word of God shape the way we think about and interpret things? Understand, we do not have to make something Christian. I'm going you know, to teach some history. I'm going to teach some science. You know, say, well, how in the world do I make something Christian? That question is answered this way. When we understand the true nature of all things, we confess their very existence reveals the power and wisdom of God. Everything comes from the mouth of God. And when we try to teach it, 
divorced from God's power, from God's wisdom, from God's pleasure, from God's beauty, from God's glory, we make it into something that it is not. By the very existence of all things, they reveal God's power. Our task is to rejoice in his awesome presence and reveal his nearness to us. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I plan to start a new lesson uh, on the 9th of April. Joe and I are going to serve that evening. Next week, John, what is going to be the topic? So next week we will begin in personal evangelism, focusing on what is the gospel message and how do we deliver that? What is the gospel message and how do we deliver it? Yep. All righty. Thank you, John, for doing that. And thank you all for coming. I want to close in prayer. Our Father, we are so blessed when we see how your word destroys and crushes the head of the serpent, how your covenant with all creation continues to give us life, continues to uphold all things, that we don't worry about the future. May we be good stewards of your world, but may we live and glorify you through it. We thank you for this evening. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you.